Hello, my name is Dr. Anya Hillary, and I'm a professor of health sciences at St. Lucie University, Madrid Campus, Spain. Today, I'm going to talk about testing for COVID-19. This presentation on testing is part of a larger lecture on various aspects of COVID-19, including the virus itself, testing, treatment and vaccines. This lecture is coming out shortly as part of a whole lecture series called Viral Thinking, produced by faculty from SLU Madrid. But for now, I will focus on testing. There are two different branches of testing for COVID-19. Testing for the virus, using a technique called PCR, and testing for antibodies, using a technique called ELISA. We'll look at virus testing first. The full name for the virus is SARS coronavirus 2, and it causes the illness now known as COVID-19. I'm not going into all the naming issues right now. Suffice to say here that coronaviruses are a large group of viruses that infect humans and animals, so-called because corona means crown. And these viruses all have crown-like spikes on their surface. So here's the SARS-2 virus with the typical coronavirus spikes. The genetic material inside is a single-stranded RNA, and that is what we measure. First, you need a nose or a throat swab. This needs to be done by a health professional to do it correctly. You do need to get right back there, to the back of the nasal cavity, to take a correct sample. This sample is then put through a biological procedure called PCR. PCR is like a biological photocopier. It produces copies of genetic material. So, it takes the RNA from the viral sample, from the nasal swab, and it copies it up to measurable levels. And so we have one RNA strand, copied up to two, four, eight, and so on. So you get this exponential increase in the amount of RNA. So from that tiny sample from the back of your nose, they can bring it up to measurable levels. If, after doing the PCR process, they detect viral RNA, then you have the infection and the virus is in your system. So this is the diagnostic test, and it means that the virus is replicating inside in your cells. We say that you're shedding viral particles, which can infect more of your cells and also infect other people. So you need to isolate so as not to infect other people. And you might need treatment, depending on how the disease is progressing and the severity of your symptoms. We also need to notify anyone that you've spent a lot of time with and warn them that they've been exposed. And they in turn will need testing and also possibly isolation and treatment. So it's vital that we test people to discover the virus. Infected people need to isolate and not infect anyone else. If we identify the infected people and look at a controlled isolation of those people, we will stop them spreading it. And that will bring this pandemic under control. Remember, PCR tests are only positive during the brief window of an acute infection. If you do a test on a Monday and you're positive, you have the virus right now. But if you're negative, it's not to say that on Tuesday you won't have the virus. Maybe on Monday you didn't have detectable levels or any infection, but on Tuesday you might. Or Wednesday or Thursday or any time in the future. And this is why certain people, for example, frontline workers, need continuous testing. Similarly, it doesn't tell you about your past. Maybe earlier in the month you had the infection and now you're over it. So the PCR is just a snapshot in time to tell you if you have an acute infection at that moment. The second part of testing is the serology and testing for antibodies. This involves your immune system. When an invading pathogen, a bacteria or a virus, infects us, your immune system releases specific proteins called antibodies. They're found in the serum or liquid portion of blood, hence serology. Globular in shape and part of the immune system, hence immunoglobulins or IgEs. We draw them schematically as having a Y shape as shown here, or even more simply like this. Up here, the variable region is where they bind to pathogens. In fact, antibodies actually bind to a specific part of the outside of the pathogen, which is known as the antigen. For the coronavirus, the antigen is the spike protein on the outside of the virus. So when you're infected, you produce antibodies against this spike protein. These antibodies can bind to the spikes and neutralize them. So they're no longer able to infect our cells. So the antibodies protect us. It's a very specific binding process. We describe it as being like a lock and a key. So for example, here's the key to my car and here's the key to my house. You can see they have different sizes and shapes. The car key will not open my house and vice versa. The three-dimensional shape makes for a very specific fit. The same way for our immune system. It will produce antibody proteins that have a very specific shape and fit for the spike protein of the coronavirus. Different types of antibody are produced at different times after infection. First of all, you see the IgM antibody type. They appear a few days to a week after infection. Then you get a big surge of another type of antibody, the IgG, and that shows up about 10 to 14 days later. These IgGs stay in the blood for a longer time to continue protecting us. These antibodies can be measured with a test called ELISA, 
which stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. I'll explain the general principles of analyzer here. There are various methods, and obviously different companies will have different variations on this. But you start with a plate with lots of little wells in it. I've shown this schematically here. Here's one well. Then you coat the well with antigen. So for COVID testing, they coat the well with the spike protein. So here's the spike protein of the virus, which is used to coat the well. Then you add your blood sample. So you see the antibody test is a blood test, whereas the PCR uses a nasal swab. The blood sample may or may not contain antibodies. You may or may not have been exposed to the virus and had an immune response. If there are antibodies, IgG or IgM, they will stick to the antigen on the walls. If the antibodies stick, the binding produces a colour change. So you know there's antibody in this sample. And of course, no antibody, no binding, no colour change. So here you see the plate with all the wells and the sample has been added. This is just a stock photo of an ELISA. Obviously, for COVID testing, this would be a blood sample. If your blood sample has antibodies, it produces a colour change. You can get huge plates now and test lots of samples at once. A positive result tells you that you have anti-COVID antibodies in your system, which means you've been infected with COVID-19 in the past, at least a week ago, because remember, it takes at least a week to make antibodies. But that then raises a very big question. If the ELISA has detected antibodies, does that mean you have immunity? The idea here is that you now have antibodies in your system so that even if you're exposed to the virus again in the future, those antibodies are ready and waiting so they can neutralize it immediately. And so you're protected by your immune system and will not get infected again. But it's difficult to be 100% certain here as there are a lot of unknowns. Remember, this is a new virus in humans. It normally infects bats. And for the first time, this strain is infecting humans. We have no prior experience here and so we don't have ready answers. For example, you have to consider how effective are these antibodies at actually binding, coating and neutralizing the virus? Well, we're not sure yet. You also have to consider the idea of immunological memory. How long do these antibodies stay in your blood protecting you? Again, we're not sure. Although, as the months go by, we are seeing some hope here and that the antibodies are lasting. And what if the virus mutates and produces new spike protein? So would that mean that we have to produce different new antibodies to neutralize them? Again, the findings so far are encouraging, and even though we know that there have been viral mutations for sure, so far it's not really affecting the serology. Another important issue is how reliable are these tests? When COVID first broke, there was a rush to get tests to the market, and some of these tests had big problems, which I will touch on now. A very big concern is the specificity of your test. Here's one example. Consider the antigen lining the well. Here we have a good test using the spike protein antigens, but here we have a faulty test using different antigens. So even if you do have the anti-COVID antibodies in your blood, it's back to the lock and key effect. These antibodies won't be able to bind here because the antigens are the wrong shape and size. So it will give you a negative result, but it's a false negative because you do have the antibodies. Or, and this is a much more serious problem, how specific are the antibodies for COVID? Let's draw the COVID antibodies with the little C for COVID up on the variable region. So that's C for COVID. But remember, we produce antibodies to all sorts of pathogens. So you could have circulating antibodies in your blood to some other infection, maybe another coronavirus infection, like the common cold, or any other infection. So these are O antibodies, O being for other antibodies. Do you see how similar they are? And this can lead to cross-reactivity. Consider the keys again. This opens my office and this one opens my back door. They're very similar in size and shape. I can actually force it a bit and open the office door with my back door key. The same kind of thing could happen with the antibodies. So it's maybe that I didn't have COVID and I don't have COVID antibodies, but maybe I do have other antibodies in my system. And these are so similar in shape and size to the COVID antibodies that they can bind to the well, given a color change. But of course, it's a false positive here because the test is recognizing non-COVID antibodies. And so you think you are safe and protected because you have the COVID antibodies, but you're not because the test has given you a false positive. So at the start, in good faith, governments and government agencies started buying up antibody tests, but then tragically, many were found to be not fit for purpose. So now we're looking at this aspect very carefully and working on optimizing the antibody test, improving the type of ELISA test we use because there are many different versions and improving the sensitivity the detection rate of the test, and crucially, the specificity or the accuracy of the test, eliminating false positives and false negatives. Moving forward, I hope you're seeing that testing is vital to addressing this pandemic. Crucially, we need the PCR test to know who's infectious and needs to isolate, as well as to track the progress of the infection. 
and we need the ELISA test to help us build up a picture of the immunity of our population and understand the immunological memory. So, as I said at the beginning, this section on testing forms part of a larger lecture on COVID-19. And the lecture forms part of a whole lecture series called Viral Thinking. So there's plenty more information to come. Thank you very much.